Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so glad to see everyone here. And thank you so much for traveling near and far to see this specially curated exhibition in today's symposium. I'm Jin Young Jin. I'm the director of Asian Art and Culture at the Charles B. Wong Center. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the Korea Foundation and Ghana Foundation for Art and Culture for making this exhibition and symposium possible. Um, also, I'd like to extend it everyone who came here with a little digitaling of uh, rain. Despite all the challenges posed by COVID, four presenters here today have worked uh, tirelessly over the three years to create this exhibition, publish a catalog, and organize this symposium, which has brought Park De Sung's extensive solo show in multiple cities in the United States. Um, the venues including LA County Museum of Art, Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College, Korea Institute at Harvard University, and now at the Charles B. Wong Center. And it will soon to travel to uh, University of Mary Washington in Virginia. Unfortunately, Mr. Um, the artist Park De Sung was not able to join us today, but we're honored to have his daughter and his grandsons with us today. So before we begin the symposium, I would like to invite uh, Christy Park, Park De Sung's daughter, to share a brief remark with us. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Kana Arts and Park De Sung, um, I'm really thrilled to Happy to be here at Stony Brook and Charles Wangby Center as his solo show. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't make his trip because of his personal plans and so on, but he was very upset that he couldn't make this trip to beautiful here in Stony Brook. And um, as for all this US continent for his traveling show, he directly messages to me that he felt like he's receiving a diploma for his entire, his career. And um, I, this morning I walked away through the hall, the hallways and the exhibition place and I was really um, inspired that Jin Jin Young um, director, like and all the crew of this museum just done a lot of work for him. I really do appreciate and hope you can enjoy this symposium and also for the exhibition. Thank you so much. So for the symposium, we have four presenters today, including me. Um, so we're going to explore the, his um, diverse body of work, park, Parks Art Combined Tradition and Innovation, Reimagining Ink in Modern World, with the subject ranging from still lifes to landscape, calligraphy, and wild animals. So our goal is to collectively delve into his remarkable body of work and deepen our appreciation for the current exhibition, Park De Sung Inc. Reimagine. We'll provide fresh insights into his art, shedding light on its intricacy, creativity, technique, and meaning behind each stroke and drop of ink. So please open your mind to possibilities of contemporary ink art to celebrate the fusion of tradition and innovation. I hope you can enjoy uh, and engage in meaningful dialogue, ask questions, and find inspiration for today's diverse perspectives. So together, we celebrate Park De Sung's artistry and rethink contemporary ink art. So I'll be the first presenter offering my interpretation of Park De Sung's Still Life series is called Archaic Beauty. And following me, Professor Jung Sil Cheni Lee will discuss how the city of Gyeongju in Korea served as a significant inspiration for Park De Sung. And Dr. Jian Kim will talk about Park's calligraphy, and Professor Suji Kim will explore the intriguing relationship between animals and humans in Park De Sung's work. So each presentation will be about 15 minutes. So 
Please feel free to share your thoughts and questions and Q&A session after all the presentation. So to my uh, topic more engaging, to the general audience, I created a six minute video providing a brief bio of the artist and decoding the contradicting meaning of archaic and beauty. So please tune in to a very short video. The old charm is still reverberating in today's life. This video centers on the unique artistry of the Korean contemporary ink painter Park Dae-sung and his captivating archaic beauty still life series. In a world constantly inundated with newness and flashing screens, Park's exploration of what truly defines something as new is thought-provoking and awe-inspiring. Park Dae-sung is renowned for his highly stylized depictions of nature and idealized landscapes, particularly mountains. With a career spanning more than six decades, his archaic beauty series offers a poignant glimpse into his extensive body of work. How do we appreciate Park Dae-sung's work? And more specifically, how do we understand the indigenous sense of beauty that Park Dae-sung claimed is archaic beauty more objectively? We must first examine what archaic beauty means. The term sounds contradictory. The two words do not seem to mesh together. Archaic can mean old, outdated, antiquated, primitive, defunct, and dead. Beauty, however, is a word with more vitality and strength. It is a virtue, an asset, and a sort of blessing for the future. How can one feel both of these contrasting meanings at once? How do these definitions reflect Pak's art and come together to mean archaic beauty? This series, which he began in the late 1990s and continues to work on today, explores the tension between the old and the new, between identity and belonging. The objects depicted in the Archaic Beauty series are imperfect pieces. They are worn, discolored, unsymmetrical, marbled with cracks and spots. So why did Pak choose such objects as his subjects? To understand, we must look at Pak's life. Born in 1945, the year Korea was liberated from Japan's colonial grip, Pak would witness the turbulent and bloody Korean War. He also faced profound personal struggles, including the loss of his parents and his left arm. These experiences gave him a unique perspective on the world, coloring a unique artistic vision. By his own admission, Pak didn't really fit in the new post-war world. He was often bullied because of his disability. He later dropped out of school at the young age of 16. The Korean art world has long valued academic achievement and particular credentials. Yet Pak was outside of the norm. His lack of formal schooling was a blessing in disguise, allowing him to see the world in ways other Korean artists couldn't. He further augmented his self-study by traveling abroad, studying ancient Chinese ceramics and paintings at the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. Among his many destinations was, of course, New York City. It was there that he connected with modern art, particularly the work of Henri Matisse. Inspired by the grand scale of ancient Chinese landscape paintings and by Matisse's aesthetic strategies, simplicity of medium, and use of negative space, Pak's journey eventually led him to the historic city of Gyeongju in South Korea. It was in Gyeongju, an ancient capital of Korea, that Pak found his home, and it is there that he embarked on his ongoing exploration of the old and the new, resulting in the Archaic Beauty series. The paintings in this series feature inanimate objects from Korea's past, rendered in a hyper-realistic style against empty backgrounds or calligraphic patterns. Some of Pak's paintings measure up to 3 meters tall by 2 meters wide in order to immerse viewers in their immense presence. The level of detail in Pak's paintings is truly remarkable. From a distance, the works exude a sense of fragility and antiquity. But upon closer inspection, every dot, shade, and color reveal the artist's choices in a meticulous, thoroughly contemporary approach to his craft. A rustic tea bowl, an unglazed stoneware vase, aged porcelain, all of these can reflect a disabled artist's struggle to find his place in a society that often lionizes physical ability and perfection. Pak's paintings in archaic beauty, with their emphasis on detailed imperfections, allow the artist to reclaim a sense of agency and to assert his own vision of what constitutes beauty and harmony. 
I have only five fingers, but by holding a brush, every hair on my brush turns into thousands of fingers to transfer my energy and sensibility into the stroke. Calligraphy, one of East Asia's most recognizable art forms, takes center stage in Pak's work as well. Despite traditional calligraphy's decline in Korean modern art, Pak places it at the forefront. He uses calligraphy as an integral design element, incorporating simplified Chinese and Korean characters to invite viewers to contemplate his paintings from different perspectives. Archaic beauty is rooted in the fragmentation and loss in Pak's life. It is an aesthetic that comprises multiple connotations, born from struggle and negative space. For the artist, it is about finding an in-between space, a place between the old and new, the past and present. Pak's archaic beauty series is suffused with a sentiment of grief and displacement, while also being a nostalgia-tinged romantic fantasy of the past. Combining the old with the new, as well as pairing absence and presence, tradition and innovation, Pak explores questions of identity, belonging, and the search for a harmonious world. His paintings offer solace and a sympathetic longing for continuity in an increasingly fractured society. Like the artist himself says, the old charm is still reverberating in today's life. that uh, it is concise enough. And by the way, the boy in the picture is not Park tae -sung. I just want to contextualize that you know, the period of era. So I hope that this video is helpful in understanding and Park's creation. And it's actually on view at the gallery as well. So next up is Professor Jung Sil Jenny Lee. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Dr. Lee. She's an adjunct professor of Korean art history at University of Cincinnati and California State University at Long Beach. She specializes in, in the relationship between tradition and modern art, uh, modernism in art, particularly in modern and contemporary Korean art in East Asia and global contexts. Her notable publications feature renowned modern Korean artists such as Ku Bo Nung, Lee Jung Sub, and Park Su Gun. Um, we actually collaborated in the past multiple times, and she created an intriguing um, educational video essay called um, The Story of Modern Korean Art, What's Modern? Modernism Through the Lens of Lee jung Sub's Bulls, which is on, uh, available on Wang Center's YouTube. So please welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Jin. It's my great pleasure to introduce Park Dae Sung's art and its significance in Korean art history. Okay. So when Park Dae Sung visited New York in 1994, he realized that the best means for achieving modernity in his art was traditional brush and ink mode, and that his ink paintings had potential to be contemporary. So he went to Gyeongju Bulguksa near his hometown and spotlighted Gyeongju's natural and cultural sites and eventually retreated to Gyeongju in 1999. In 2015, Park donated numerous artworks and personal collections for establishment of Gyeongju Solgo Art Museum. Since then, he was exhibited new works continuously in the museum. Therefore, Park Dae Sung's art world cannot be appreciated fully without comprehending his passionate perception of Gyeongju and also epic reconstruction of his, uh, its cultural relics during the reinvigorated second half of his life. So today, I discuss the artistic identity and achievement of the Korean painting master who revived and modernized visualization of Gyeongju in his idiosyncratic painting style with transformative narrations and innovative displays that surpass the is, um, what is it, historicized, usually we kind of historicize our tradition, right? So surpass that kind of historicized traditions and religious philosophies. 
representing from Gyeongju. Gyeongju has been significant for its abundant cultural heritage and famous pilgrimage sites based on its status as Shilla's capital for about 1,000 years. Gyeongju became a locus for Golden Kingdom's royal tumuli and burial goods, along with ubiquitous Buddhist sculptures and architecture. Bulguksa Temple and Sokuram Grotto were two major state-sponsored projects epitomizing Shilla Buddhist art and in the mid-8th century. After the Shilla and Goryeo dynasty fell, eventually its Buddhist monuments and icons were abandoned under the suppression of Buddhism. Mongol and Japanese invasions burned down most wooden architecture and destroyed stone structures. Gyeongju came to be considered a time-honored province and its Buddhist relics almost forgotten under Joseon Confucianism. Under Japanese colonial rule, Gyeongju regained its reputation, attracting Japanese archaeologists for collecting and reconstructing Korea's past for cultural colonization, in which aesthetic memory of Korean tradition was reinterpreted. The Bulguksa repairs and Sokuram reconstruction project were conducted under the Japanese colonial supervision. The value of Gyeongju Buddhist sites rose due to scholars' attention and tourism. With economic growth in the late 1960s, President Park Jong-hee used the invented tradition in Gyeongju to establish post-war national identity and pride by restoring the spirit of the unified Shilla kingdom. Since the 1990s, Gyeongju has changed rapidly with cultural commodification and technological adaptation, along with Gyeongju World Culture Exposition from 1998. In 1995, Bulguksa and Sakuram were registered as a UNESCO World Heritage Sites. At that time, Park Dae-sung began embodying new images of Gyeongju in his modern ink paintings. So Park Dae-sung painted a few vistas of Gyeongju during the 1970s and 80s, adopting the Shilgyeong Sansu, real scenery landscape tradition. So here, Park um, presented Gerim, the birthplace of the legendary presenter of the royal um, Shilla family. <clears throat> and he presented uh, Gerim uh, in this large size, um, kind of acrylic on cloth, uh, titled Ancient Capital. And Park's motifs and style changed actually drastically after he returned from New York to Gyeongju. And as after his painting trip to also Silk Road, as you saw in the video, uh, in summer of 1999. So Park came to prefer monochrome painting in dark ink against white space to the overall application of light colors in his early landscape like this. So at the same time, Park retained literary painting traditions, constantly studying calligraphy and developing his own Chinese, Korean, and hieroglyphic calligraphy styles while incorporating literary texts. In 1995 and also 96, uh, Park painted panoramic views of the Bulguksa facade through the four seasons, mainly with heavily applied dark ink and bold brush strokes. This is an atypical image of Bulguksa, which usually is photographed from an angle that avoids trees that block views of the building. His snowscape down, uh, he displays um, brightness of unpainted white spaces against black outlines under heavy, dark sky. Both sides of the landscape are framed by dusky ink rubbings of vertical wood blocks from Park's antique collection. The wood blocks are carved with the text in Chinese characters by the mid Joseon Confucian scholar who lived in Gyeongju. Ink rubbings of the wood blocks were made on separate papers that were attached to the painting, revealing reversed characters of writings on the wood blocks. Park intended to use the rubbings not for decipherable text, but rather for design elements at each side of the painting. Park pursued this harmonious communication and reciprocal empowerment between painted images and borrowed characters for the visual presentation. Park also took stone sculptures at Sakuram, the images of the main Buddha and ten disciples, as a sole subject of other paintings like this, transforming them into large two-dimensional representations. The effect of rubbing on stone was achieved by Park's brushwork, adding painterly expression to application of stone powder and soil on inked paper. 
White outlines are surrounded by numerous smudge ink dots, creating a granite-like texture. And Park transformed the three-dimensional theatricality of the Sakuram Grotto into planar works filled with spiritual vitality and auras of the textured icons and the luminous mandula and imagined lotus flowers. Beginning in 1996, Park considered the connection between Bulguksa and Sakuram, located 2.5 miles apart. He presented multiple works titled Cave of Light, and one of them you can see in the exhibition. And they include both Sakuram midway up Tohamsan and Bulguksa at the foot of the mountain. It's topographically impossible for the grotto and temple to be observed in one view. But Park rearranged the sites to present them all together, condensed into the heavy ink mountains in a vertical format. The main Buddha of Sakuram on the mountain at upper left reflects sunlight from the rising sun on the winter solstice. The main Buddha at Bulguksa uh, corresponds to the full moon in the lunar calendar's first month, envisioned in the foreground forest under the mountain. Between the temple and grotto is a white staircase, an imaginary psychological mode of connection. Such expression of simplified architecture and re re revelation of a hidden path is comparable with traditional true view landscape in the late Joseon period. And such rearranged disposition of two distant sites under full you know, sunside, sunlight or moonlight and the combination of the illogical perspectives in one painting composition with a linear plan in the foreground are common in Park De Sung's uh, Gyeongju paintings from the 2000s. Park's other modern true view landscape, a dark moon on the right, includes Bunhwangsa Pagoda, the oldest dated pagoda from the Shilla period, and Posokjong, a royal palace site where the Shilla kingdom met its doom. This painting suggests the same intention of the artist to reconstruct the composition by uniting two geographically distant yet historically bonded sites on one painting surface. The round moon projects a triangular beam of light directly over the niche of Bunangsa Pagoda, where an imaginary city Buddha resembling the sculpture in Sokuram is installed. The refracted light extends from the Buddha to Posokjang. The moon is bright, but the trees in shadow reveal light, penetrating the oldest stated Shilla Buddhist relics to the latest Shilla repository of history with depth and significance. Bach contemplated the East Asian idea of the relationship between humans and nature, using circular, rectangular, and triangular form to symbolize relation, correlation, and unity among heaven, earth, and the light in between. Park's semiotic landscape paintings reveal his omniscient viewpoint and historical narrative, achieving modernity be beyond the boundary between figurative representation and abstract composition with a saturated ink brush. Along with Nam uh, Tohamsan, uh, another mountain in Gyeongju, Namsan, is the most important locale in Park's Gyeongju paintings. Namsan is especially famous for having been a huge sacred complex containing temple sites, stone pagodas, sculptures, as a roofless shrine and museum of Shilla Buddhist art. One of the first that um, museum actually that Park noticed at Namsan, um, first monument actually, was an engraved rock in Tapgok, meaning pagoda valley. So this fold boulder called Buddha rock is covered by at least 36 iconographical images of Buddhist figures, including four directional Buddhas, pagodas, guardian animals, and trees, suggesting perfect integration of Buddha land at the site. Park often observed Tapkok Buddha rock, painting it in different perspectives, scales, and textures. You can also see one in the, in the exhibition. Um, in next version, yes, this version, um, Park experimented with multiple perspectives, looking at three different sides of at once of the Buddha rock. 
The boulder surface is splayed out and the stone pagoda is in the background, while a thin, tall tree penetrates the, in the middle of the painting as if it were a crevice in the rock. In 2020, Park spread out the Buddha rock more extensively. Describing the iconic monument in a reorganized re composition on a two-dimensional plane titled Buddha Village. This um, time, uh, the seated Buddha in the middle uh, on a lotus throne reflects the rising sunlight with intense yellow radiation. Park depicted granite surfaces with a rubbing effect and painterly application of ink by using brushes and creatively representing the massive and vertical monument as an array of planar figures in a horizontal format, like unscrolling from right to left. As he showed in the Cave of Light series, here he also attempted to combine Namsan's Buddha rock and Bulguksa temple in his winter scene of Bulguksa and also in the ex exhibition. Such boundless freedom of spatial rearrangement continues and expands the potential of Park's modern ink painting. In paintings titled Namsan, Park arranged Buddhist stone sculptures, pagodas, and temple buildings at Gyeongju with a condensed centripetal composition. It's um, reminiscent of a description in a traditional map, uh, reflecting the real scenery landscape trend of the late Joseon period. Similarly, Park describes specific monuments in his symbolic ink landscape of organic hills connecting by um, winding path. So extending further from cartography, however, Park emphasized cosmological interconnections among things arranged on the mountain as the moon at upper left sheds light on Posokjang at lower right. The artist's symbolic you know, fusion of heaven and earth and of Gyeongju's cultural properties is manifested in his masterpiece, Dream Journey to the Kingdom of Shilla. You can see it's a smaller version uh, on display. Park's adoration of the ideal Shilla land is revealed in Katush, containing his calligraphy, meaning complete and unobstructed interpenetration of things in perfect unification harmony, or in a fusion of subject and object. Park applied this spirit to his painting composition and technique, longing for enlightened understanding and smooth communication between artists, Shilla ruins, and viewers of the series without hindrance. The representative Shilla remains are depicted on each mound, arranged in the form of fully open lotus petals. Similar to his blossoming uh, composition of Mount Kumgang on display. Also, it is uh, comparable to Jongsun's combination of numerous true view landscape paintings, like on the right, Mount Kumgang, where the artists amalgamated essential views of the spiritual mountains in a perfectly unified composition. The sun and crescent moon hold a fully blossomed Namsan at opposite corner, subtly illuminating the scene with cosmic light. Paktik pits not only remains found on the mountain, but others from beyond the site that are historically and spiritually representative of Shilla heritage in Gyeongju. Above all, the simplified image of the nine-story pagoda at the center, which works as a stamen of the lotus flower, reminds us of the magnificent nine-story wooden pagoda at Hwangnyongsa that was burned to the ground during the Mongol invasions in 1238. Park has summoned existing and also lost Shilla monuments into the geography of Namsan at Gyeongju using conceptual topography of the famous ruins. Moreover, his special, uh, special pressing technique using the brush creates an effect similar to texture rubbings of granite surface, as if he immediately copied what is there now. The imagined ex existence of ancient objects transcending time and space leaves permanent mark uh, in Park's landscape. In form and content, Park's breathtaking painting manifests Gyeongju as a reliquary of Shilla treasures in an ideal, harmonious landscape. Park identified himself as an heir to ancient Shilla spirit. He had been using pen names for himself, such as ancient Shilla vessel, ancient Shilla man, and ancient Shilla master. After he settled in Gyeongju, 
the pen names appear more often in most of Park's works, which were painted in Gyeongju. In his, this painting titled The Song of Solgo, the Solgo refers to a Shilla painter famous for a painting of old pine trees on the wall of the Hwangnyongsa temple. And Park had heard of about Solgo since childhood and admired his ability to grasp the vitality of pine trees in his realistic painting. Park's painting depicts the pine forest with rocks and a pond in and around his backyard which he observed from his studio in the forest near Samneung at the western foot of Namsan. The painting's title and the inscription allude to the honor Park gave Solgo by identifying himself with the Shilla painter spiritually and stylistically. It is no coincidence that the Song of Solgo was donated to and also displayed in the main hall of the Gyeongju Solgo Art Museum, which shares the painting's name. Finally, unexplored view of Samneung shows another view from his studio. The rocks, stone, um, the stone sculpture, and pine trees in the foreground are visible in his backyard, marked by a fence, and bright light shining through the pine forest is visualized glowingly in the ink painting in a modern idiom of yellow pigments and geometric shapes uh, infused into cherished items in his yard. Unexplored view of Samneung epitomizes Park's painting style and philosophy of penetrating boundaries between tradition and modernity, realism and conceptualism, painting and sculpture, nature and art, and self and other. So Gyeongju has been long been remembered for Buddhist architecture, stone sculpture, and golden treasures and vessels excavated from royal tomb, but not for his painting, its painting from Gyeongju, which could not have survived from the ancient world. So as the first art museum for Korean paintings in Gyeongju, the name of Gyeongju Solg Art Museum symbolizes a connection to the forgotten tradition of Shilla painting and calligraphy. Park resurrected the spiritual Buddha land through the innovative brushwork and compositional arrangement. His modern ink paintings of Gyeongju go beyond the spirit of true view landscape and literary paintings through his own imagination and sense of design, uniting painting, calligraphy, and seals. Through Park De Sang's renovated vision, Gyeongju Solgo Art Museum is the representative venue for revitalizing Shilla's lost or for, um, frozen art history. And this summer, his most recent project replaced the dream journey to the kingdom of Shilla on the museum's curved wall into this. So he's titled this project, Korea Fantasy, and gathered symbolic relics from prehistory Korea's petroglyph, murals of Goguryeo royal tombs, representative artifacts from two other ancient kingdoms, Baekje and Shilla, and unified Shilla, to his own antiques from Joseon period, flanked by the portrait of Dangun, on the right corner, legendary founder of the first Korean state, and the title of the first Korean script on the left at the bottom band. So these cultural treasures are under everlasting nature, the sun, moon, constellations like the Big Dipper on the right corner, and Korea's tallest mountains, Mount Baekdu at north, and Mount Halla, the Sunrise Peak and waterfalls in Jeju Island at south, and the most beautiful Mount Kumgang at east coast. So this seems to be his ultimate ideal landscape, following the cosmic philosophy of infinite inner penetration. The modern Shilla man's destiny is to unify memories on the Korean Peninsula and shine universal light on our conflicted, divided world with his living brush in Gyeongju. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And I hope that everyone is inspired to visit Gyeongju, South Korea. Our next speaker is Dr. Jiyeon Kim, who is the Korean art curator at the Peabody Access Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Her research interests um, encompass social status and artistic identity, the role of gardens as social spaces, 
and the history of Asian art collections in Boston area museums. Her most recent research focuses on traditional characteristic of art object created during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Currently, she's working on to opening the new Korea Gallery uh, in 2025 in her museum. So please welcome Dr. Kim. Thank you, Jin Young, um, for the introduction and also for the beautiful installation. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming to the symposium. Uh, t uh, the title of the, my talk today is Park De Sung's Way of the Brush. So, what is his way of the brush? Park De Sung used two words, sodo and pilto, interchangeably as driving force of his work. Sodo can be uh, translated as the way of calligraphy or the way of writing. And pilto can be translated as the way of the brush. What is the way then? Yes, this is the way, the Tao, as in Taoism. Tao can be conceived in multiple ways, but at least for Park De Sung, one of its key meanings is the way of the trade, something you can achieve through constant training and devotion. Park De Sung's artistic identity is indeed contained in his brushwork. As the previous speakers all mentioned, Park De Sung is a self-taught self artist, and he learned calligraphy uh, relatively late in his career. In 1988, he met the Chinese painter, painter Li Koran, and Li advised him to practice calligraphy in order to strengthen his brush stroke. Since then, Park has tirelessly trained himself in calligraphy. Even now, he practices every day, at least an hour a day. Park's recent monochrome ink paintings are a manifestation of a historic concept, Sohua Dongwon, meaning that calligraphy and painting come from the same origin. It is the belief that these two, art, two forms of art are equally the channels of the artist's inner self and creative power. Park gradually internalized this concept through years of physical practice and realized the core principle of traditional calligraphy in his boldly modern artworks. His way of the brush in this sense realizes an essential characteristic of Tao, the belief that Tao is something spontaneous and constantly transforms itself, often unintentionally. Park's recent, recent works are a natural uh, outcome of the tradition he internalized and of, great, and of gradual and inclusive transformation. Okay. Uh, this transformative process can be clearly seen in the comparison of these two works. One of his earliest masterpieces, for, uh, Frosted Forest on the left, is delicately painted sketch uh, is a delicately painted sketch of nature. You can definitely see the lyricism and his vault to also soft touches that makes a very convincing foggy landscape. His recent work, Song of Solgo, Solgo on the right, adopts a similar composition with diagonal trees on the right and vertical trees on the left, framing the central void. However, the soft modeling and atmospheric space of his early work completely disappear, and the surface of the late work is completely flattened with sharply defined ge geometric form. The boldly simplified trees and rocks are not constructing a visual illusion. Rather, they loudly speak for themselves, that they are traces of the artist's powerful movement. The way Park De Sung holds his brush is rather distinct. He grasps his brush firmly and upright with his forefingers. He pulls the brush with his thumb and, and the index finger and pushes it with his ring finger. This way, he cannot freely move his wrist. So his, his movement, his arm movement is like this, push and pull. Instead, he has to move the entire arm and even the shoulder to maneuver the brush. According to the artist, he learned this method from monk painters, and it can be traced all the way back to the Korea, Korea period woodblock carving technique. The method actually mimics an inscriber's movement of the chisel. But also heard, only with this method, 80,000 and more woodblocks of Tripitaka Koreana, or Palmandejanggyeong, could be inscribed with so few typos. 
He said, after mastering this technique, he can maintain the maximum level of concentration and achieve consistency and accuracy while transferring all his bodily energy to the tip of the brush. Park Dae-sung trained calligraphy by studying old masters. He was particularly inspired by the 19th century Korean scholar Kim Jong-hee and emulated him in various aspects. But as you can see, Park's calligraphic style is distinctly different from Kim's. Here, you can, you can see what Park dae means by writing like carving. His calligraphy was, um, Kim's calligraphy was also inspired by ancient inscription, but, you can, but uh, as you can see here, it's, it's sort of, yeah. Oops. Yeah, so the, this one is Kim jong his one, Kim jong his calligraphy. So um, Kim's calligraphy um, is very fluid, and we can really see his brush movement. We see this variation of the speed, changing pressure, delicate undulation of each line, uh, and we can really feel the flexibility of the brush. On the other hand, Park's strokes are more even and steady, really like carving. Another difference is Kim's composition. I think you can see with those um, guiding lines. Um, uh, it's more structured. Kim Jong is one on the bottom, structured and squared and tighter, while Park's calligraphy is relatively freer and irregular. It all summarizes Park's own style that culminates in his later paintings. In the chapter that I wrote for the book, Park Dae Sung Ink Imagined, I talked about how Park Dae Sung's work made gradual transformation after he studied calligraphy and, in that sense, he, how he relearned his painting. Here I will show some of his works that exemplifies this, trans this transformative process. Until the end of the 1980s, Park's painting remained largely natural naturalistic. In a recent reflection on his early works, Park said the painting of this period were more composed of flesh rather than bones. Sunrise Peak on the left does partially employ the calligraphic brush strokes. Overall, however, the strokes are applied to delineate the textures of the natural objects, and the, the main strength of the painting is found in its elaborate pictorial craft rather than the brush itself. The change of his brush after he started his calligraphic training is evident in the painting of the same scene on the right, done in 1919. Uh, right bottom, <laughs> uh, they done in 1994. In this version, the straight vertical texture strokes on the rock builds a skeletal frame of the huge mount. Similarly, the brush strokes of the bamboo are greatly enlivened with, oh, with all these leave, oh, leaves dynamically turning directions. Around this time, Park also started to incorporate inscriptions into painting. In these two paintings, he included Korean translation of early Korean and Chinese poems written in classical Chinese. Classically, paintings, painting, calligraphy, and poetry are considered sister art. Their seamless integration signified an epitome of literary art, summarized by the phrase, the three perfection, or samjar. Unlike old literati, studied painting first and then practiced calligraphy later, as a means of, mainly as a means of improving his painting. He rarely composes the writings for his own inscription and generally places little weight on the thematic relationship between text and image. So some of his work, including these early examples, do show such a relationship. In numerous interviews, the artist repeats that he considered calligraphies in his painting primarily as design elements. In Silvery Sound, on the left, um, the dense vertical brush strokes of the center become sparse as they move toward the right and then smoothly merge with the three lines of the Hangul calligraphy. The inscription of the dawn on the right plays a more prominent composition role in the painting. The characters roll down from the tree, tree branches like a beaded screen, shadowing the entire left half of the painting. The granulated texture of the inscription echoes the pattern of the cottage roof on the right, 
starting its role as a key pictorial component of the, um, component of the painting. With the calligraphic training, Park's brush strokes gradually free themselves from object's form and attain the anatomy. Mountain Forest, 1994, showcases this process in a single work. The left side of the painting is more traditional. The foreground hill is painted with vertical strokes and dots. This part. Following the three-dimensional contour of the hill, Namsan in the background is skillfully delineated with traditional fibery texture stroke. The receding mountains in the far distance are painted with delicate wash, convincingly creating, creating a deep atmospheric, atmospheric perspective. On the right side, however, the strokes become thicker and more liberated. The lower right, yeah, here, this part, The lower right section of the painting looks extremely bold. Here, the texture strokes do not follow natural contour of the rocks and terrain, as done on the left. The vigorously hatched lines make this part of the painting flat and abstract, so different from the rest of the painting. The year 1994 was pivotal in Park's career. In the winter, he left for New York to have a first-hand experience of contemporary art in his very center. The trip eventually enlightened him of the potential creative power of the traditional ink and brush as a tool of contemporary art. The most dramatic transformation of Park's work was made after the trip during the second half of the 1990s. Buddha Rock on the left, painted in 1996, exemplifies the evolution of Park's work in this period. It is it is drawn with thick and rugged calligraphic brush strokes full of energy force, key, and physical strength. Here, we only have a glimpse of the poetic and picturesque of his early works in the background. The artist's virtue also realistic technique is still sensed through the delicately drawn temple and pine forest in the background. Oops. Yeah, here, this part. The traditional ink, uh, ink brush methods are also seen limitedly in the left foreground and a little bit in the center. The brush strokes of the rest of the rocks and Buddha images, on the other hand, are del deliberately made crude and ambiguous. Most interesting are the thick double lines half framing the three Buddhas at the top, the top part. These heavy dark lines that resemble ropes or perhaps snakes rejects the three-dimensionality of classical calligraphic strokes created by, created by flickering and turning up the brush because he didn't really use his um, uh, wrist. Uh, these flat strokes slowly and forcefully pulled and pushed over the paper best demonstrate what Park Tae-sung means uh, by drawing like carving. Park used these lines more freely in the late 1990s and afterwards. In Cave of Life on the right, he filled the entire painting with thick black lines created by the simple pull and push motion of the arm and shoulder and minimum wrist movement. Even compared to Buddha rock, the space become apparently flatter and more abstract. Park's conceptual large-scale landscape series of the 19, uh, 2000s, such as Hyunyang and Hyunyul here, mostly successfully delivered the feeling of this sublime through this very distinct maneuvering of the brush along with the powerful composition. The sharply carved strokes more cons conspicuously dominate the surface. And by this time, Park was fascinated by the concept of darkness or black, which is the color of the mock, the traditional Asian ink. For Park Dae-sung, black is the color of creation. He said, the darkest time of the day is when you can see everything. It is the time when the world renews. Park is known for his use of chomu, the black undiluted um, ink. He even applies this undiluted ink on other black, creating a slightly burnished surface with great depth that uh, they can only be noticed at a closer look. Here you can see the image of powerful generation or starting from the darkness. Yeah, so you can see the same idea of generation and regeneration through repetition and the primordial explosive power embodied in carving-like brushwork. 
By this time, Park further explored the idea of writing and, writing and started to create his own calligraphies, a separate independent work rather than um, part of his other paintings. He was always interested in the design aspect of calligraphy, but he became fascinated by the concept munja and its origin. Munja means writing, writing system, character, or text, and to Park De Song, uh, it means civilization, not only in historical sense, but his own artistic journey. This is what Park De Song said. Without Munja, we were like animals. With Munja, we started to evolve. With only the discovery of Munja, humans were able to exchange information, record their history, develop science, and achieve today's civilization. How do I see Munja? I had no school education, so I, I'm not the person who knows Munja. Therefore, I look into it with nature's method. Just as when, when I encounter nature, I use Munja in my own way. Despite being an avid practitioner of calligraphy for several decades, Park says that he does not know Munja. What he implies here is that his learning of Munja is purely on his own, without depending on standardized education. The way he writes his characters is indeed distinctly unconventional. In addition to uh, the unique method of holding and moving the brush descri described above, his, uh, his writing speed is extremely slow and he does not follow the conventional stroke order taught by traditional calligraphy teachers. Instead, he intensely concentrates on the character's forms, the length and width of line and shape of the hooks, the angle of the turns, and the intervals between strokes. Like the earliest paintings and petroglyphs, many of these pictograms depict animals. As Dr. Suji Kim will discuss in the ne next presentation, relationship between humans and animals and the harmony between living things and the universe are a favorite subject of this picto uh, pictograph series. So this is my last slide. Many of, many of his calligraphy words are humorous and playful as he explores the idea of Munchas' archaic origin. In the couplet, uh, composed of rivers and mountains, like embroidered silk on the left, uh, and mountain high, high uh, water long on the right, uh, Bach amuses the viewer by highlighting the Chinese character's pictorial origin. I guess you can all guess which character represents which on the right. I want to finish the talk with another quote uh, from Park De Song that I think best summarizes his way of the brush. He said, once I acquired the brush method, I gained confidence and I can bring anything into my painting. Before, I was always insecure in my expression and felt anxious of failure. Now, whenever inspir inspiration strikes me, I draw it and work is completed. I just relax and drop my brush onto the paper. Thank you and I hope you all enjoy the show. I hope that you all inspired to uh, participate in our upcoming hands-on workshop, Way of Brush, uh, which is scheduled on November 10th, uh, Friday. Uh, so I hope that you can sign up uh, for more, uh, more experience. Our last speaker for today is Dr. Suzy Kim. She's an associate professor of art history at the University of Mary, Washington in Virginia. Her research investigates how constructivism and international style became the primary source for multifaceted cultural phenomenon in Japan and Korea from 1920s onward. She serves as a contributor to our current exhibition, um, an exhibition catalog, and she will be the host of uh, Park's ex exhibition at her university galleries, which will open next Thursday, October 26th. So please welcome Dr. Susie Kim. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, if you have friends and family in Virginia, Maryland, and DC area, please uh, encourage them to come to our opening reception, which will happen October 26 from five to seven.
The steep vertical view looking down the cliff edges of Mount Kumgang in Heaven, Earth, and Human, Chunji In, epitomizes the distinctive landscape painting style by Park Dae-sung. Given a bird's eye perspective, the viewer feels as if flying over the jagged mountain peaks and looking down to Earth. This peculiar angle is much steeper than the typical bird's eye view used in East Asian landscape tradition and adds a contemporary touch. The minimalized rendition of a Buddhist temple complex in the lower middle part of the cod composition emphasizes the painter's appreciation of nature over human habitation. In this painting, it is noticeable that the artist has rendered the landscape more from the viewpoint of a bird than that of a human. As the artist says, quote, when I was in Manhattan, I looked up to the skyscrapers. I felt as if I was inside Mount Kumgang. I wanted to be a bird and look down to the landscapes like a hawk. That's the perspective I apply to heaven, earth, and human series, end quote. Intertwining the feeling and thoughts of animals with human imagining and depicting animals acting or thinking like humans is evident in Park's paintings. His depiction of Mount Kumgang is, a close, uh, is close to the old uh, Chinese saying, Hyungjung uh, Kyugak, which means mind landscape. The painting shows the inner thoughts of the artist rather than realistic rendition of the objects. The artist is not considered as a passive viewer, but becomes an actual part of the depicted landscape. The painting, combining the idea of mind landscape with bird's eye perspective, should be understood as its adoption of the point of view of a hawk flying over the landscape and thus a zoomorphic image. He did not limit his interest to birds. Another of his works, Flower Blossomed Mount Kumgang, has an oval-shaped composition that creates the effect of a fisheye camera lens. The circular angle called wongak combines with contrasting light and dark ink, a vertical lines of the rocks, and the narrow and straight waterfall in the middle. Whereas the left side of the waterfall depicts the overlapping peaks of the mountain, the right side with eight small blue plants on the bottom is abstracted, rendering the thick stripes on a colossal lotus flower bud. The rendition of Mount Kumgang, which he has visited 15 times, and the lotus flower are an amalgamation of his deep appreciation of Buddhist philosophy, flowers, and mountains. Through his painting, Park wanted to illustrate his dream of becoming a fish. In his dream, he contemplated his favorite mountain from the perspective of a fish. His fish dream corresponds to two old Chinese sayings developed from the philosophical parables in Zhangzi, sayings of Master Zhang, written by Chinese philosopher Zhangzi. Chugek ilche can be translated as the host and the guest are one body or phenomenon, and mula ilche means the object and myself become one body. The concept of an interchangeable dynamic relationship between human and animal is illuminated in Zhang Zi's butterfly dream story, in which Zhang Zhou awoke after a dream, but he didn't know whether he was Zhang Zhou who had been dreaming, or he was the butterfly, or that he was the butterfly now dreaming he was Zhang Zhou. This parable, as well as Park's fish dream, questioned the customary distinction between transient illusion and reality, but at the same time, it aligns with the anthropomorphism. The diverse viewpoints in Park's painting originate from Korean folk paintings. In an interview with the author in June 2021, Park said he liked how Korean folk painters did not try to render an object from one focal point, but invented their own composition and depicted objects from different angles by arranging them in one screen like Tekori, the Korean still life paintings with books and things. In addition to adopting Western rendering of objects and space in a realistic three-dimensional manner by linear perspective, Korean painters became more imaginative, adding their personal taste of viewing and composition and painting objects from above, behind, and below. As proof of Park's full indebtedness to animals, his over uh, includes numerous small and large paintings, the main subjects of which are our fellow species, such as bulls, herons, owls, ducks, peacocks, horses, cats, and imaginary dragons. Since the 2000s, Park has incorporated animals in his landscape paintings or created scenes from a bird's eye or fish eye view. 
This presentation examines how he questions the future of human civilization through his animal paintings with anthropomorphic images and landscape paintings with exquisite animal perspective. In these paintings, Park depicts animals as possessing the ideal characteristics of humankind and makes them a metaphor for our constructive future. Since the late 1990s, he added animals in oversized landscape paintings. The largest with animals only is bullfighting, Wugong Tuyangdo, which depicts nearly life-size bulls. His deep love of animals stems from his belief that they represent human ideals. Finding powers or qualities we cannot possess has been common in zoomorphic and anthropomorphic East Asian paintings since ancient China. In some of Park's paintings, animals are cherished above humans. Park believes we come from and will return to nat nature when we die. Appreciating nature and adjusting our lives to what nature has given us is most important. He said, quote, I believe that as human beings, we come from nature and go back to nature. I feel that following the rules of nature is the most natural way for, of living for us. I'm deeply concerned how the emphasis on science and the history of human civilization goes against the rules of nature. We must follow the providence of nature, the essence of Korean spirit, end of quote. Park's condemnation and destruction of nature evokes the hypothesis proposed in 2000 by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer uh, that the Holocene Age has given way to the Anthropocene Age, marked by the permanent record of human activities in the geological record. With the declaration of the Anthropocene comes a warning of the side effects of the scientific revolution and a call to safeguard the sustainability of nature, points that comport with a park's view on the destructive character of human nature and his emphasis on the virtue of animals. He really loves bulls, the animal valued most in agricultural society and folk paintings. The tension between two massive energetic bulls wrestling each other under the sun has been rendered with the power of the ink brush, chomuk, thick and rough black ink, and it's used in both bulls. You will find another bull painting out in the exhibition. The colliding heads with the weight put onto uh, the front body, firmly stabilized legs, and very aggressive, fiercey eyes reflect the artist's admiration through combined use of dry and wet ink. Park grew up watching and drawing bulls in Chengdu, a county famous for bulls, which later established an annual bullfighting festival held usually in early April. When the painting is approached, the viewer confronts the fighting bulls as daunting size at or above eye level. The massiveness of the animals and their life gestures overpower the viewer, and a sublime feeling of awe and powerful nature emerges, a demonstration of Park's aesthetic appreciation of nature in the Anthropocene. To avoid anthropocentrism, Park warns us that we should not just think about the benefits domesticated bulls bring to human society, but to consider them as our companions with equal rights and to respect their own perspective on life. The Mount, in Mount Hala, Park claims the heron is himself, which is actually located up, oh, I hope I can, right there, <laughs> yes, right there. Uh, it, it, he has, uh, he has er entered his himself as the heron himself, uh, contemplating the main tourist spots of Mount Hala that he rendered in a very imaginative way. The surrounding cliffs, old trees, and Cheongbang Pokpo waterfall, the misty void between the waterfall and the mountain peaks, and Pengnuk Dam, the mountain lake in the volcanic crater on the top of the mountain. Park's representation of himself as a heron reveals his deep appreciation of birds and benevolent animals. He loves birds and raised many kinds in his garden, such as ducks, geese, peacocks, and an owl, and rendered them in the many paintings. In his painting, like this one, an owl, uh, Park put the Korean translation of the first three verses from the first chapter couplets of Pop uh, Gugyeong, which is the Dharmapada Sutra. The Buddha's teaching of a well-controlled, pure mind represents the symbolic characteristics of the owl in Buddhism. Owls are considered as the wisest birds among night birds and said to possess wisdom and knowledge that humans cannot easily obtain. In Korean folk myth, owls are smart, beneficial creatures protecting the rice paddies against rats and harmful insects. Because they never close their eyes, they also symbolize study, research, and future dreams or goals. Uh, in addition to that, with one eye open and one other eye closed, a park's owl winks at the viewer. 
The Wink of an Owl, as art historian Eugene Wang notes this in his analysis of Chinese artist Huang Yongyu's A Winking Owl, can be interpreted as a wink or having only one eye open. Either way, one eye open and one eye closed connotes visual ambiguity, simultaneously indicating distrust and trust, hostility and friendliness. Another Owl of Down shows two owls perching on the roof of a gate inside the Chongmyo complex in Seoul at the guarding the empty shrine. The side roof of the east end of the Chongjun, the main building of the royal shrine, is visible in the upper right corner of the image, and the east gate of the Chongmyo has been added on the left front side of the image. Park rendered the inner colonnade of the Chongjun under the middle roof located on the east end of, of the building. The watery and soft brush strokes fill up the night sky, adding a misty feeling. The night scene is lit with the bright full moon behind the two owls sitting on the east gate. The slightly overlapping vertical strips of the Korean roof tiles kiwa rhythmically fill up the hipped gabled roofs and occupy most of the giant horizontal painting. He added two owls as if the structure made to house the sacred spirits of the royal family had given way to owls rather than humans. The mysterious nighttime gaze of the owl toward the human viewer is intensified in this other Owl of Dawn. Park said he started this painting in Japan after being impressed by a wonderfully aged cedar tree in front of an old Shinto shrine in a rural village. When he finished his painting later in Korea, he changed the tori, the entrance gate to Shinto shrines, into a Korean entrance as he wanted to add Korean sentimentality to his night scene. This narrow vertical middle staircase reaching up to the entrance of the religious shrine or temple is lit by moonlight only, whereas everything else is placed in complete darkness. In this painting, a whimsical cartoonish owl who appears all too human looks directly into the eyes of the viewer while sitting on a thick branch of an old Japanese cedar tree. The duck, which stems from Korean shamanism, appears in Park's other works as an animal having a beneficial relationship with the humans. For instance, Flowery Sound renders a bird-shaped vessel with light ink combined with peony design on the ground where the duck sits. The object looks like a copy of the duck-shaped uh, pottery excavated from Gyeongju. In the Silla Kingdom, the citizens believe that birds, especially ducks, carry the souls of the people to heaven after, earth, after death, like water and bring rain. Therefore, the duck-shaped vessels are used in Kiuje, a ritual held to pray to the gods for rainfall. In Korean folk culture, ducks were also believed to have long lifespan and symbolize good marriage. The duck swimming on ponds under the willow trees is a well-known motive that often appeared on Kundika vessels from the Korea period. Different from everyday animals, semi-natural uh, semi uh, natural and imaginary dragons allow humans to add power and abilities they wish to possess, enabling them to undergo a zoomorphism. Park's Tokdo depicts the island in the East Sea of Korea, which ownership has long been contested by Japan until very recent. Park combines circular-shaped clouds hovering over rocky scenery with a dragon holding a red uh, yoijo, which is a Sentamani stone, a magical stone that has the power to fulfill the owner's wishes. In both Chinese and Korean folk legends, dragons possess such stones. According to Park, this dragon symbolized a protective animal, possessing the power to protect the island against Japan, just as a Joseon king would do. The inscription added on the left side of the painting shows clear evidence that Park rendered the dragon, specifically a sea dragon, as a symbolic animal representing King Munmu, the 30th king of the Korean Shing the kingdom of Silla. King Munmu unified the three kingdoms and asked to be buried in Taewang Am in front of the East Sea so that he would become a dragon and protect his nation from foreign invaders. Depicting the protective power of an authoritative, uh, authoritative person in zoomorphic form and making connection to the qualities of the dragon in traditional paintings has a very long tradition in East Asia. During the Chinese Song Dynasty and afterwards, dragons were added in paintings that featured lightning, a sign of their power to summon rain.
Possessing an enigmatic control of water, the dragon became the symbol of authority and good fortune, and also an emblem of the Chinese emperors. Uh, for uh, Zen Buddhists, the dragon is a cosmic manifestation, symbolizing the intangible vision of truth, and the Taoists believe this imaginary animal had the ubiquitous force of Tao, the way or a path. In Korea, as early as the Three Kingdoms period, the dragon motif frequently appeared on various grave goods such as swords, incense burners, bracelets, saddles, and headdresses. After the Ming imperial court, uh, court, uh, court granted a red dragon robe to the king of Joseon in 1444, an image of a golden dragon was integrated into the king's robe and stitched on the chest, the back, and both shoulders. The dragon became a symbol of power for the kings who reigned during the Joseon period, as well as a symbol of the Joseon royal court. The dragon motif was added to the ceiling of the throne canopy in palaces, together with the phoenix. Both legendary animals were believed to reside in heaven, and so showed that the king's authority came from heaven and was limitless and supreme. Also, in addition to that, uh, the dragon motive was used to, uh, as a decorative border or main figure in blue and white porcelain and other ceramics. Here, uh, the Ntokdo park depicts an oversized five-claw dragon. The dragon with five claws instead of ordinary three or four is associated with the Chinese emperor and Korean kings. By adding a claw, park imbued the animal with the symbolism of a king, more specifically King Munmu. The curled light grayish dragon body uh, protrudes from the abstract clouds with multiple zagged lines. The gesture of stretching out one leg like a human arm, bulging eyes, whimsical nose, and a dragon beard, a beard may have been inspired by the designs on the blue and white porcelain jars of the Joseon period. Here, the dragon represents the protective role of the Korean government or king for its citizens in a national crisis. The dragon's secretive, secretive power symbolizes the protection of the Korean people from harm. Park Zumor forces the human act of safeguarding and claiming ownership and develops it into an animal form, the dragon. To conclude, Park's animals are very powerful. Throughout Korean art, they often symbolize protection, wisdom, power, and strength. The wisest of the animals to Park were birds who carried the souls of the dead from earth to heaven and could freely, freely fly above the mountain peaks that Park always wished to contemplate. The zoomorphic and anthropomorphic images and landscapes rendered through an animalistic view amalgamate with a park's re reinterpretation of conventional Korean ink painting techniques and its appreciation of nature based on East Asian philosophies and religions. The artist playfully combines the existing paradigms of text and image in traditional ink paintings with exquisite renditions of the landscape framed with a unique perspective from above, below, and within. He expresses himself through bird's eye or fish eye views of the landscapes and through paintings of our fellow species. He regards animals as following the principles of nature. He visualizes an ideal relationship between us and animals and thereby questions the future of human civilization in the Anthropocene. His animals present the ideal characteristics of humankind and represent the positive side of human nature. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite all the speakers to the stage for a um, Q&A session. So all our speakers are here to engage with you. So pl please feel free to comment or raise questions. So one of the great aspects to work with a group of colleagues is that the Park Desang has so vast collection of uh, creations, so we ended up choosing very specific subject that we felt, you know, appealing. So I ended up choosing still life, and you know, each one had a different subject to explore. So it was a really amazing collective effort together. And also, the audience is still alive, so we were able to, uh, you know, collaborate at his direct quote and then ask direct question what it means. And so it has been a really great uh, experience, especially during the COVID. We've been meeting on a regular basis to, you know, develop this project together. So 
anyone who has a questions, but wait for the microphone because uh, we are recording. So I'll pass the microphone to you. Thank you, ladies, for such a powerful presentation. Um, I am very curious in his relationship in terms of gender and nature. Was that ever a consideration um, in his work? Did he um, consider assigning uh, the feminine as uh, the mother goddess in the work or the masculine? So uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, and he, um, as far as I know, he didn't really um, have a clear line. I mean, have, had distinguished, have had a clear distinction between the role of women and the and the role of men, and how in his art different genders are depicted. But at least, I mean, he talks a lot about um, how his paintings are like. Um, representation of the universal like order and uh, universal like principle that include include uh, the heaven earth and human so uh, the human exists in between the in between heaven and earth and then the human is of course is composed of men and women but probably you are all familiar with this concept of yin and yang and and his um, composition is heavily inspired by this universal harmony that include yin and yang uh, but i don't know if do you have do you remember any of his remarks that he talked about this gender i don't recall the specific message he had on the gender issue um, but i can tell that he has that recognition and acknowledgement about the um, respecting the other gender uh, from his marriage life. <laughs> and he has a really close relationship with his wife, who is also an artist and a Western style artist and actually uh, Catholic um, religious sculpture and paintings were done by uh, his wife. And she's also very productive at this point too. And also we can see over how many years of marriage? 30 years or 40? 40 years of marriage, 30 years of marriage, and they were really, really respecting each other and assisting each other and helping uh, together to understand the deep meaning of uh, life and nature, also in the same religion, in Catholicism. So I, I think that actually embedded in his uh, painting just naturally how he uh, really observed the nature in the awe of humanity and also, you know, God. Linus and, and including all this nature all together, not really separating um, you know, female or male like that. Also the image of Buddha or our other you know, uh, religious images as well, you know, that's also very much of you know, including all this separation and also very spiritual uh, objects that can embrace all the humankind. So I, I can see that. And also his all kind of uh, usual general gesture to other audiences or viewers or collectors or scholars like us, he really treated us as a really res respectful way. And we can tell that his attitude of that is kind of included or embedded in his paintings as well. Yeah. He always included the moon instead of using the sun, which is in Korean culture, the moon representing more the female side. So the loss of his maternity because he lost his parents when he was really young. And as you can see, even if it's like, it looks like very like yellow bright, but that's like full moon. And it'd be all representing of their, the longing of their mother and for the feminine side. And you know, so that's why he always tried to capture the the lotus flower, like the blooming side of the using as a moon of the feminine side. So as he, you can see the, his gender issue. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Oh, thank you. 
I believe earlier you mentioned that he used animals to represent people or even himself. I wanted to ask more about that. How, how does he choose the animals he uses for the representation? Is it just based on what he's drawing or does he have an idea in mind? Uh, so in one of the interviews, he actually mentioned that that's my self-portrait, and he loves uh, representing himself as a bird. I think uh, the bird is probably the animal that he loves to, uh, to use as his own self-portrait, and that's why the bird's eye view from above is very frequent in uh, most of his um, uh, Chunjin series, which are the uh, the heaven and earth and human series. And uh, I think the perspective, uh, probably the most uh, beloved animal that he has in mind is probably the bird. Yes, and he mentioned this, uh, mentioned this uh, quite a lot in his uh, interviews that he always thinks about, you know, from an animal perspective rather than from a human perspective. Uh, so with his style, it obviously evolved a bit with his stroking as well, but um, in, in other ways were there, you know, his stages of life being reflected in his work as he continued on? Does that, does that make sense? So I think, I think as, 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 uh, as I said in my presentation, I think the biggest change in his life is when he started uh, practicing uh, calligraphy. He was always a really, really excellent, like, um, uh, you know, the painter, a draftsman, he was an excellent, like, designer, and then we can see uh, this aspect, continually see this aspect uh, in his, uh, even in his, like, recent work, uh, but, I, uh, but he, after he um, uh, studied calligraphy, he, his, his art became like uh, more like abstract and modern. And then, it, and then another um, uh, another um, event, <laughs> a meaningful event for him is his trip to New York, and um, his and his numerous like travels. And uh, and after each travel, he incorporate like new elements to his art. So as so he already has <laughs> had a lot in his like um, in, uh, in in his like young um, age, and then after that, it is like a great, as I said, it's a gradual transformation. He just incorporate every like experience into his life gradually and continuously. Does that? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you so much, everybody. I mean, who worked for the uh, exhibition is just so fascinating. And you know, here at Stony Brook, we don't have that much opportunity to see uh, the artworks uh, by the Korean artists to this extent. So this is great opportunity. And I also really enjoy the symposium because you introduce not only the works on exhibition right now, but uh, his work before his trip to US and uh, you know, after, so uh, it was kind of full spectrum uh, understanding his work. I personally like his work in mid 90s. <laughs> so uh, as organizers of this touring exhibition, I just want to ask you this question. Uh, I mean, having this exhibition already in the US is a sign that his work is now communicating globally. Uh, with the viewers outside Korea, but what do you think are the strengths or the factors that allow his work to communicate with viewers globally? So it's actually very hard when it comes to calligraphy because it's hard to read. Um, people feel distance if they see something that, that they cannot read, but I think this time this is not the case. It's mostly about the form. It's about the strength of the brush. And as you know, in East, uh, in East Asia, uh, the brush is the spirit of the artist. I think that makes him more appealing to the international audience. Uh, I also believe that uh, the scale, <laughs> it's definitely about the scale. It's just getting bigger and bigger. And nowadays, he's making even bigger ones, right? And I think the scale and kind of like this very vast perspective that he's providing uh, to the viewer is definitely appealing to the global audience. Actually, I want to um, 
add one more event <laughs> for your question. So he met his wife, and his wife was a um, Western painter, and then he adopted color. So in, he, uh, he introduced color to his work, so that's another like, significant event for him. Yeah, it's just... Uh, <laughs> If there is no further questions, uh, we would like to continue the celebration at our opening reception. I mean, I'd like to invite you all to the Skylight Gallery, so we're going to continue our conversation. But thank you all, both the presenter and audience, uh, to make this event so meaningful. Thank you.